To be a Christian is not simply to be a believer. Now, I always thought that Christians were believers. Much more than that. Christians are called to be disciples. And there's a big difference between being a believer and being a disciple. Now, you say, what's the difference? Well, disciples are people who do what Jesus expects them to do. And, 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 and my church never put the screws on me. It never made me realize that. They, they said, you've got to believe certain things. But what they asked me to do, what they asked me to give up for Christ was minimal. When Jesus confronted us, and when Jesus confronts us today, he doesn't say you have to give up throwing a quarter in this machine or you, you have to give up smoking and you have to give up. All of those things are to the plus side of the ledger. But this is what he says. If anyone is going to be my disciple, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself, he says, forsake all, take up the cross and follow me. You say, what does that mean? Well, to the rich young ruler, he puts it this way. If you're going to be my disciple, he said, this is what you've got to do. You've got to sell what you have and give to the poor and take up the cross and follow me. Now you're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you suggesting that a Christian cannot really call himself a Christian unless he responds to the needs of poor people? My answer is categorically, yeah. That's exactly what I'm saying, and you're hearing me out perfectly if you got that message. If, if, if you can hold on to money while, while you watch somebody starve to death, I have to seriously ask whether or not you're a Christian. You saying, wait a minute, I tithe. I give one-tenth of my income to Jesus. Hey, I want to point it out to you clearly. Tithing is something that is taught in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus does not ask us to tithe. If that was true, we'd have to rewrite the hymn book. One-tenth to Jesus, I surrender. One-tenth to him, I gladly give. All together on the chorus. I surrender one-tenth. You know, I mean, what, what, what would you say? Is my one-tenth on the altar? You've got to be kidding. When Jesus calls you to be his disciple, he calls you to become radically committed. And, and the thing is, that as I, as I look over this group, I know we've got hundreds and hundreds of believers here tonight. Hundreds and hundreds of believers. The last thing I learned was this. I learned that uh, if I really wanted to find Jesus, he was in the sky, he wasn't in the sky, and uh, he, he wasn't uh, flying around in heaven. If I really wanted to find Jesus, get this carefully, I would have to look for him in people who are hurting. I, uh, I remember being in, uh, in Haiti and then in the Dominican Republic. And I was waiting for a little airplane to come and pick me up and fly me back to the capital city. As I stood there at the edge of the grass landing strip, a woman came towards me, holding in her hands her little boy who was dying, dying of starvation, and malnutrition, I guess, rather than starvation. He was very sick. Oh, he looked all gone he was a black kid but his hair had turned red from malnutrition and big chunks of it had fallen out his eyes were crossed because his eye muscles had deteriorated and his arms and legs were as spindly as my thumbs and the child hung limp in the mother's hands and she held up this kid to me and she said mr Take my baby. Take my baby, mister. Take my baby home to your country. Heal my baby. I, I pushed her away. I, I couldn't take her kid. But she kept on pleading with me. Take my baby, mister. Please take my baby. I kept on pushing her away, pushing her away. Finally, the airplane came into sight. The minute I saw the thing, the minute I saw that airplane, I ran towards it to get away from her, but she came running after me, screaming at the top of her lungs, screaming, don't let my baby die, she kept saying. Don't let my baby die, she kept screaming. I ran towards the plane, she came running after me. I jumped to the plane and I closed the plexiglass door. She caught up with the plane. She was banging on the door, banging on that glass door, holding that dying kid, that ugly kid in her hand. She bangs on the door and she's screaming at me to take her kid. I told the pilot to get us out of there. and and, and 
and he, he got the engine going so that the noise of the engine drowned out her screaming. But I knew what she was screaming. Don't let my baby die. Don't let my baby die. And I said, get gone, get gone. And he got the plane going, and we went down the runway and into the air. And halfway back to the capital city, it dawned on me who the baby was. The baby was Jesus. I said, wait a minute, how, how can he figure the baby was Jesus? It was Jesus who said, in as much as you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. And as much as you fail to do it unto the least of these, you fail to do it unto me. When I look at another human being, no matter how sick, no matter how infirm, no matter how hungry, no matter how dirty, no matter how naked, I look at Jesus Christ himself because mystically and wonderfully Jesus comes at me through those who hurt. I would have to say about myself that I'm a Christian. And I believe that a Christian should be somebody whose heart is broken by the things that break the heart of Jesus and who is angry over the things that make Jesus angry. The result of that is that very often I come across with almost a revolutionary fervor. I think that every Christian should have a revolutionary fervor. I think that every Christian should look at the world as it is and be angry at it and dream of the world as Christ wills for it to be and say, why not? Why not commit my life to affecting the world and changing the world as much as possible into the kind of world that God wills for it to be? Somewhere right now, a small child is suffering, ill-nourished and poorly clothed, living in tragic surroundings without access to education or medical care.